Hello and welcome to the start of the audio reading of Elatsoe by Darcy Little Badger with illustrations by Ravina Kai. First I will start with reading the description of the book. Imagine an America very similar to our own. It's got homework, best friends, and pistachio ice cream. There are some differences. This America has been shaped dramatically by the magic, monsters, knowledge, and legends of its peoples, those indigenous and those not. Some of these forces are charmingly every day, like the ability to make an orb of light appear or travel across the world through rings of fungi. But other forces are less charming and should never see the light of day. Alatsue lives in this slightly stranger America. She can raise the ghosts of dead animals, a skill passed down through generations of her Lapan Apache family. Her beloved cousin has just been murdered in a town that wants no prying eyes, but she is going to do more than pry. The picture-perfect facade of Willoughby Mask, Willoughby Mask's gruesome secrets, and she will rely on her wits, skills, and friends to tear off the mask and protect her family. Darcy Little Badger is an extraordinary debut talent in this world of spe speculative fiction. We have paired her with her artistic match illustrator Ravina Kai. This is a book singular in feeling and beauty. Chapter 1 Ellie bought the life-size plastic skull at a garage sale. The goth neighbors were moving to Salem and they could not fit an entire Halloween warehouse into their black van. After bringing the purchase home, she dug through her box of craft supplies and glued a pair of googly eyes in its shallow eye sockets. I got you a new friend, Kirby, Ellie said. Here, boy, come on. Kirby already fetched tennis balls and puppy toys. Sure, anything looked astonishing when it zipped across the room in the mouth of an invisible dog, but a floating googly skull would be extra special. Unfortunately, the skull terrified Kirby. He wouldn't get near it, much less touch it. Maybe it was possessed by a demonic vacuum cleaner. More likely, the skull just smelled weird. Judging by the soy candles and instant incense sticks at the garage sale, the neighbors enjoyed burning fragrant stuff. Look, a treat! Ellie put a cheese cube in the skull's mouth. Although ghosts didn't eat, Kirby enjoyed sniffing his old favorites, chicken kibble, peanut butter, and cheddar. He'd been her best friend for 17 years, 12 alive and 12 dead. And Ellie was confident that if food couldn't persuade him to be brave, nothing would. Yum yum, she said, smells cheesy. Skull friend won't hurt you. Kirby, in a fine example of the English Springer Spaniel breed, hid under the bed. Fine, Ellie said, we have all summer. She'd spent five dollars on a gag, a gag that would not be abandoned after just one wasted cheese cube. Kirby had progressed a lot since his death. Ellie still wasn't allowed to bring him on school property, but since the sixth grade howl incident, Kirby hadn't caused any trouble, and his cachet of tricks had doubled. There were the mundane ones, sit, stay, heal, play dead, literally, wink wink, and track sense. Moreover, the door had been opened to a bunch of marvelous supernatural powers. He had he just had to learn them without causing too much incidental chaos. Ellie ate the cheese and checked a squeaky yellow bear plush across the room. Stop mid-arc. Suspended two feet above the gray carpet, the air around Bear Buddy shimmered and its head squished twice. Squeak, squeak. Good boy, Ellie said. Maybe for Kirby's peace of mind, the skull should make a funny sound. Rattle? Will we scream? Bear Buddy flopped out of Kirby's mouth and landed on the hardwood floor with a pathetic half-squeak. Strange. Usually he would turn the toys to Ellie. Kirby wasn't the kind of dog who treated fetch like a game of keep-away. Bring Mr. Bear! Bring it! In response, Kirby turned fully visible as if something had flipped a switch from shimmery transparent to opaque. You okay? Ellie asked. It took effort for the dead to be seen. He rarely became visible without her clear command to appear. What is it? Are you still scared? Does this help? She covered the skull with an old sweater. 
and instead of relaxing, Kirby tucked his tail and darted from the bedroom. Hey! Ellie ran into the hall, but he wasn't there. Kirby! she called. Here, boy! He popped through the stucco wall, whining. Paranormal vibrations hummed through her bones. She felt like a tuning fork, one resonating with worry. He was anxious. Terribly anxious. Why? The skull? No, he couldn't see that ridiculous thing anymore. When Ellie's grandfather had a heart attack, Kirby threw a fit as if he could sense Grandpa's pain. Maybe, to ghost dogs, emotions resembled radio signals? The signals were strong when they belonged to a loved one? Could somebody be in pain? Somebody Kirby knew? Ellie's parents were at the movies with their phones turned off, sitting in that dark theater. During a rare but treasured date night, would it also be their last? No. No. Maybe? She tried calling them both. No answer. They were probably fine. That said, every night Ellie left the house, the oven was probably turned off. But she still double-checked its knobs anyways. Ellie had to know with absolute certainty that her parents were safe. The six-screen theater was five miles away from home. Three miles if she cut through the river using the old railroad bridge. It had been close to traffic for it had been closed to traffic for years. Ellie couldn't remember the last time a train tracked the heterotonic river on its rusty tracks. Sometimes, as Ellie walked home from school, she noticed people on the abandoned bridge. It drew even greater crowds at night. Darkness protected graffiti artists. They climbed 40, 50, 60 feet above the river to paint the highest trusses. She wondered if the risk was worth the payoff. From the deck, a plummet into the Heratonic River might be survivable if the artist could swim and the river was calm. Much higher? Perhaps not. It was possible, likely even, that those who climbed bridges at night were more resilient than mere humans. If so, Ellie didn't want to meet them. She could handle mundane things like violent men with guns or knives, but every tunnel, bridge, and abandoned building in the city was allegedly home to monsters. She'd heard whispers about clans of teenage-bodied vampires, carnivorous mothmen, immortal serial killers, devil cults, cannibal families, and slender people. Even if most of the urban legends were fictitious, Ellie had a ghost dog companion. When it came to strange things, she could not be too open-minded. At the front door, Ellie slipped into tennis shoes and a reflective athletic jacket. Her bike had red lights on its handlebars and seat. They might alert drivers to her presence, but she needed something stronger to illuminate her path across the bridge. After a moment of frantic searching that left half the kitchen cabinets yawning open, she grabbed a battery-powered flashlight from the clutter drawer. Heel Kirby, she said, and they stepped outside together. Ellie lived near the top of a small mountain. The ride downhill will be quick, if not safe. She fastened her helmet and pedaled her bike to the crack lattice cement street. From a hundred-year-old oak tree that dominated her modest lawn, a barn owl hooted twice. When Ellie penned it with her flashlight beam, the bird lighted from its branch and, slightly flew, and silently flew away. Damn it, Ellie said. Many owls, most owls, were just ordinary birds with a greater reputation for wisdom than they deserved. Ellie regularly volunteered at a raptor rehabilitation center. There, a great horned owl named Rosie fought everything that moved, including the bald eagle in a neighboring cage. Veterinarians, hand handlers, rustling leaves, and its own shadow. Ellie's grandmother often said, a wise woman knows how to pick her battles. Ellie would add that an unwise bird nearly dies by attacking its reflection. The second kind of owl, though, owl with a capital O, was a bad omen times ten. Owl will wait until your life skirts the precipice of tragedy and shove you straight into the abyss. As Ellie sped downhill, her wheels click click clicking double time, the neighborhood was all cricket chirps and empty streets. People started work early in her blue collar town. They might not be sleeping at 9 p.m., but they were settling down. Television screens projected talk shows and sitcoms through uncovered windows. 
Near the base of the mountain, the buildings she passed abruptly changed from private homes to businesses. Lee's brakes hissed across butyl rubber as she took a sharp turn on the main street. To the right, three men sh- smoked pungent cigars outside a tavern called Roxy's. She parted their sour-smelling mist. Hey, slow down, one guy hollered, and she could not decide whether he sounded angry or amused. Brick factory buildings flanked the river, their facades crumbling, their windows dark and occasionally cracked. They used to manufacture plastics in town, and the chemical footprint persisted. White signs warned would-be fishermen, warning, catch and release only, heritonic fish and wildlife continued animated with PCBs. Near the bridge, somebody had vandalized a catch-and-release only sign with a skull and crossbones. Fun! Ellie walked her bike across a rocky strip of weeds between the street and bridge. Long grasses brushed her cotton pants, every tickle unnerving. She imagined disease-filled ticks scampering up her legs. Their bites would stitch a quilt of welts and ring-shaped rashes across her fe- flesh. Her father counted every tick he extracted from dogs and cats at the public shelter. Every year, the number rose. They were either more abundant or more efficient hunters. Ellie had not decided which was worse. Before her, steel trusses jetted out from the wide bridge deck and cut the sky into diamonds. At sunset, the slices of empty space resembled jewels on a giant's necklace. A metal walkway ran along one side of the bridge. The smooth, narrow surface was easier to bike across than gritty cement. Ellie jumped on her bike, then shifted to a higher gear and accelerated. Her legs burned from her calves to thighs. Although she biked often, she also biked slowly, always mindful of her surroundings. But it was nighttime. Darkness obscured the view, and there were no pedestrians to avoid. Or so she thought. Halfway across the bridge, part of a dia- low diagonal beam shifted. Somebody was trying to climb the great structure. Keyword? Trying. As Ellie approached, the person slipped a couple inches and dropped something. The op- object, which was suspiciously shaped like a spray, can- spray paint can, fell into the river. Just passing by, Ellie shouted. She mentally reached for Kirby. He was at her side within seconds, an invisible comfort. Dead or alive, dogs could skip from deep nap unconscious to awake and ready for anything almost instantaneously. She envied their skill. The person flattened against the wide beam the same way squirrels put their bellies to the ground and froze when they were trying to escape notice. Ellie stopped, balancing on her bike wheels, and one steadying foot, ready to ride at a moment's notice. Kirby was wagging his tail, acting like he knew the wannabe Spider-Man. Did he? Was this why Kirby had been so upset earlier? You okay? Ellie asked. She shone her flashlight at the climber. It illuminated his backside in an awkward angle. The butt did look familiar. Stand back, he called. I'm gonna hop down. Okay, his voice sounded really familiar. But she must be mistaken. Jay? You cannot be... Hey, careful, don't fall into the water! In an attempt to dismount from the beam, the climber swiveled around, chest against the metal, his feet dangling several feet above the deck. Then, he dropped onto the walkway with a graceful thunk and roll. Yep. Ellie had seen that somersault before. It was him. Jay Ross. She and Jay met when their mothers attended the same Lamaze program. They weren't next-door neighbors, but they lived on the same block, went to the same school, celebrated their birthdays together. Point was, Ellie knew Jay, and he'd never done graffiti more permanent than chalk on the sidewalk. Second point, Kirby also knew Jay well. Maybe Ellie didn't have to worry about her parents after all? Ellie propped up on her bike and on its wobbly kickstand. What are you doing? She asked. Ellie? Jay lifted one hand, his index finger extended, and poked her in the middle of the forehead. It is you! He laughed and ducked his head, embarrassed. Sorry, just had to know that you were solid. This bridge is supposed to be haunted. It is, she said. My dog's here. Are you okay? 
Kirby? Hey, boy, are you taking a walk? Jay leaned over and wiggled his fingers, enticing the dog closer. Always excited to meet an old friend. Kirby ran out to him. Jay petted the shimmer over ha uh, hot asphalt mirage that signaled an invisible ghost, mindful to not put his hands through Kirby's body. Ellie, did you catch my paint? He asked. The river caught it. He lightly smacked his own headphone. His own forehead. Always bring a backup. Of course I'd mess this up. And what is this exactly? Should I be worried? It's just, it's personal. Don't worry. It can't, I can't continue without paint anyway. Right, are you walking home? Want to borrow my jacket so cars can avoid you? For probably the first time ever, Jay wore black from chin to toe. His tennis shoes, sweats, and turtleneck were ripped from a cartoon of, ripped from a catalog of cartoon burglar apparel. In fact, at certain angles, he resembled a floating head. A head with short blonde curls and wide set hazel eyes. He and Ellie looked pretty different. Just to annoy her. As children, they'd pretend to be twins, but strangers didn't believe that a white Celtic and Nordic American boy and a brown Apache girl came from the same family. Thanks, he said. But it's fine. I'm wearing a yellow tank top under this. Look. He whipped off the turtleneck so quickly that his fabric fluffed his hair with static electricity. That wouldn't do you any favors if you fell into the water, she said. Climbing human pyramids doesn't qualify you for this. Oh no, I don't climb. I'm the base during stunts, Jay said, as if her misunderstanding of cheerleaders, cheerleading procedures was the real issue. You should find a safer spot to vandalize, or not vandalize at all, how about that? Ellie, I'm not here to paint, he said. It's Brittany. He slumped on the tracks and with his knees tucked against his chest. Jay looked sad. Puppy in the rain sad. As much as Ellie loathed the romantic relationship talk, she'd never been on a date, didn't plan to go on a date, and didn't know how to counsel or console friends about the whole dating thing, she couldn't leave a puppy in the rain. Brittany, she asked. Your girlfriend, Brittany? Or the Brittany in chess club who hates you? Girlfriend, he said. Ex-girlfriend. Guess both Britneys hate me now. Sorry, I didn't know. Just happened yesterday night. He wrapped a metal bar uh, behind him. The last night, last time we came here, she drew a heart in the bridge. Had our na names in it. J plus Brit. I just wanted to draw a zigzag crack down the middle. Looks like it's broken. Uh-huh. So 20 minutes ago, did you feel a strong emotion? Fear, maybe? Not really, he said. Damn, we can brainstorm a safer gra graffiti plan tomorrow, okay? She said. Gotta go. He stepped back, nodding. What's the rush, Ellie? Do you want company? Uh, no thanks. She threw one leg over her bike and balanced on her tiptoes. I'm worried about my parents because... Well, it's probably nothing. Doesn't matter. You have my number, he said. Need anything? Give me a call. Same here. She reached out to ruffle his hair, and Jay tucked his chin to help a five-foot-nothing buddy out. His scalp shocked her. That's supposed to be lucky, Jay said, smoothing down his hair. It occurred to her that luck could be bad. Mounting dread chased Ellie across the bridge, down a web of streets, and through the cinema parking lot. She spotted the bride family car, a battered-looking minivan, near the entrance. Her parents were the kind of people who enjoyed Monday movie nights because the low traffic freed superior parking spots and theater seats. Flush from the two-wheel exercise, Ellie leaned against the ticket booth and asked, When does the movie The Lonesome let out? Fifteen minutes, Yim Play said. His red vest and usher uniform was a couple sizes too loose. It made him seem too young for the night shift. Can I wait in the lobby? she asked. That's fine, just stay behind the velvet rope. He seemed ambivalent to the bicycle, so Ellie wheeled it inside to prevent that mountain bike had new high-performance tires. Although their performance rating was based on grip, maneuverability, and durability, Ellie figured that they also performed well at attracting thieves. Plus, her bike was neon green, not the most subtle color. 
Inside the lobby, several Formica top tables were cluttered beside the concession stand. Popcorn kernels crunched on their Ellie's tennis shoes and became lodged in their squiggly treads. She sat and basked in a butter-smelling air, com- comforted by the relative calm. Her parents had made it to the movie theater in one piece. They weren't trapped in a burning wreck along the highway. If her mother or father had experienced an in-movie health crisis, one painful enough to trouble Kirby, there'd be EMTs outside and several missed calls on her phone. Still, Kirby didn't tuck his invisible tail and run through walls for fun. Who else did he know? Jay, Ellie, Ellie's parents, all safe. The goth neighbors used to love him. No surprise there, but they were a thousand miles away by now. Nothing she could do to help them. Kirby also cared about Ellie's grandparents, cousins, uncles, and aunts. Did she have their numbers? She scrolled through her DM history and found a two-year-old conversation with cousin Trevor. Although they used to be tight, Trevor's life became hectic after he married a teacher named Lenore Moore, and moved to the Rio Grande Valley, and had a baby. The baby, now seven months old, had been born premature, almost dying twice in the neonatal intensive care unit. Little, little Gregory is doing now, though. Good now, though, right? Right? Ma'am, do you need anything? The concession clerk asked, and it took Ellie a moment to accept that at 17, she was now old enough to be called ma'am by strangers. No thanks, she said. She needed the night to end without death. She needed to be overreacting. She needed Carpy's fit to be a fluke. But were they needs or were they wants? Did Jay need to break a cartoon heart in the Heratonic Bridge? He acted like it, risked his life for it. Maybe sometimes the wants felt like needs, because the alternative hurt too bad. A few minutes later, the post-movie crowd filled the lobby. Ellie left her bike propped against the table and found her parents near the bathroom. Ellie, what the heck are you doing here? Her father asked. Luckily, he sounded more concerned than angry. You biked here? Her mother asked. In the dark? Do you realize how dangerous that is, Ellie? What if a car hit you? Your phone was off, she said. Plus, I have a, I have warning lights and Kirby came with me. Ellie took a gulp of water from the drinking fountain. Kirby freaked out. He was zipping through the walls. Last time that happened, Grandpa... Hey, what's wrong? Her parents were glued to their smartphone screens. Six Smith calls, her mother said. Are most of them from your brother? Her father asked. He called me too. Did he leave a message? Mom? Dad? Shh, Ellie, I'm listening to voicemail. What did Uncle want? Ellie asked, and she felt goosebumps rising on her arms. I don't know, but he sounds terrible, her mother said. I I need to call him back, right now. The family exited the theater and congregated around their minivan. The nearby mountains perspired, soupy mist flavored every breath Ellie swallowed. She eavesdropped on one side of the conversation that became more frightening with every word. How bad is it? It was followed with, what did the doctor say? And is there any chance he'll wake up? Then Ellie's mother started shaking so hard that she almost dropped her phone. That's how she cried. No tears, but lots of shivering. Like her sorrow was an earthquake, not a storm. By the time the call ended, They were alone and Ellie was terrified. Trevor was in a serious car accident, her mother explained. She bowed her head, already mourning. He's being treated at the Maria Northern Trauma Center. It it probably won't save his life. Cousin Trevor? Ellie asked rhetorically, because who else could it be? Yes. Mom. Ellie said she shouted shrill, desperate. If he dies, I can... Ellie, no. Her mother cut her off. But I... You must never... Raising her voice now. You must never... All humans, all of us... Without exception, her father continued. Because he was capable of calm speech, practicing veterinary medicine had not hardened his heart but it taught him how to restrain signs of pain. Human ghosts 
are terrible things. Ellie looked to the sky. She saw an owl circling overhead. And that is the end of chapter one. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you will continue uh, listening for chapter two. Have a great day.